Uh, good morning and welcome. I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Uh, I love uh, this series of conversations that we started at our Global Energy Center, the CEO series. Uh, I love it all the time because we bring in chief executives of important companies from all over the world to talk about the issues that they care about, uh, whether they're energy issues, political issues, social issues. But I'm particularly happy about this one because it brings to our stage uh, someone who I think is not only representing one of the more interesting energy companies, not only in his region but the world, but also one of the more interesting thinkers I've run across in thinking about the region. Um, so I think you'll very much enjoy the conversation that uh, Dick Morningstar, Ambassador Morningstar, the director of our Global Energy Center, uh, will have with Majid Jafar, uh, chief executive officer of Crescent Petroleum. Um, through creating these dialogues, we've been hoping to facilitate a flow of information that will help both private and public leaders better navigate uh, the defining economic and political challenges of the 21st century. We also don't feel that the private sector voice is heard often enough in the policy conversations uh, here in Washington, and so we're also trying to hope, we're hoping to generate a little bit more of that as well. Uh, previous installments of this series included a conversation with Tom Fanning, Chairman, President, and CEO of Southern Company, Sharif Suki, uh, Chairman, President, uh, and CEO of uh, Chenier Energy, and I'm delighted that we can add you, uh, uh, Majid, to this roster of esteemed speakers. Uh, uh, the conversation comes at a crucial moment for the energy world and highlights a leader and company operating near the epicenter of challenges that were unimaginable even a few years ago. Uh, 12 months ago today, crude oil prices were hovering over uh, $100 per barrel as of this morning. I believe they're below 60. Uh, the precipitous drop in prices, uh, driven by lagging Asian demand growth, surging U.S. shale output, and record high production levels in Saudi Arabia and Iraq has upended the global energy order. Usually in my lifetime, when we've had uh, the kind of global insecurity and volatility that we've had, you've had energy prices going up. But because of the, uh, the, the trends in the world, particularly uh, U.S. Uh, energy production, you've actually had them going down. And the Iran agreement uh, uh, could add an additional, I think wrinkle is probably understating uh, what it could add in this already complicated picture. A resource-rich Iran poised to reopen its energy sector to foreign investment could potentially add hundreds of thousands of barrels per day to an already oversaturated crude oil market, potentially driving prices even lower. At the same time, ISIS' uh, rapid rise in Iraq is creating even more internal and regional instability, threatening politi political and economic viability of states across the Middle East. Uh, uh, our speaker today confronts this volatile business environment as the head of Crescent Petroleum, the Middle East's first independent privately owned petroleum company. Along with its affiliate uh, Donna Gas, Crescent Petroleum is the largest private investor in the Kurdistan region and has operated in Iraq South for more than 20 years. So this also very much builds off uh, a recent event we had here uh, with President Barzani. As private sector leader, Mr. Jafar aims to achieve not just prosperity for his company, but also the greater economic well-being for the Middle East at large, and he's a very important thinker on that set of issues. Uh, so we'll be focusing on his energy expertise for sure, but I also think today we'll focus on his thought leadership in both policy and industry, a balance we value here at the Atlantic Council. He recognizes that a multifaceted approach is necessary to solve uh, uh, the uh, problems, challenges his industry faces, and certainly the problems and challenges the region faces. He's known for tackling such pressing issues as access to education and youth unemployment in the Middle East, increasing engagement of women in the workplace, reshaping corporate governance in the region. In 2014, he founded the Center for Economic Growth, one of the first organizations of its kind in the Middle East which connects the region's private sector to universities in order to find solutions to key issues like job creation and economic growth. Uh, speaking at the World Economic Forum in Davos, where we've uh, grown to know each other, on the urgency of addressing youth unemployment in the region, he said, quote, 
the recent fall in the oil price is also a warning that the region cannot be over-reliant on er energy resources for GDP growth. We must create long-term sustainable economic growth. Employing our youth is the key to unlocking our true natural resource. We cannot achieve political stability without economic stability. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing you elaborate on these sentiments in your commentary today. And following your remarks, we'll have a discussion moderated, uh, as I said, by uh, Dick Morningstar, founding director of the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, who will also entertain questions from the floor. Majid, thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Majid Jafar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Salam alaikum. Um, it's a great honor to be here. It's actually my first uh, visit to the Atlantic Council here in uh, in Washington. I've had the pleasure of attending the. I will uh, go for breadth as opposed to depth uh, in my comments and try and touch upon a lot of different uh, topics, and hopefully that'll give us an opportunity in the discussion and the Q&A to, to dive into some of the issues in, in a little bit more depth. Um, so Fred mentioned the, the last 12 months as being a big change. Um, I want to take a slightly longer uh, time scale and go back 15 years uh, to 2000. Uh, I was uh, only a few years out of university working for Shell uh, International in, uh, in London in the gas and power space. Uh, oil was in the low teens. Uh, we were screening projects at $6 a barrel. Natural gas, uh, Henry Hub was about $10. In California, it had spiked at $30. And Enron was uh, uh, making money out of that. And the US was all about the import story. I mean, the whole international natural gas uh, industry saw the United States as a sink. And uh, applications were all over the place for LNG import terminals. And it was thought that you know wherever you found natural gas in the world, uh, you could just send it to the US. Um, and the Middle East was stable. Stagnant, perhaps, but stable. So 15 years on, which is not a long time, uh, in, in even the energy industry's several cycles. Uh, it's a completely different world. We have, even at $60 or $50, relatively high oil prices, uh, historically speaking. Uh, and over the previous four years, very stable at about 110 Natural gas prices in the US, <laughs> you know, the very low, uh, or back to the, the low when there was the, the gas bubble, sort of 2 $3. Uh, the U.S. is an export story now. All those LNG terminals are being uh, converted <laughs> into export. And the Middle East is extremely volatile. A um, uh, lot of change. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it violent and, and, uh, and a lot of instability. So huge changes in the, in the energy uh, sector. And even though I'm here mainly to talk about the Middle East, my region, I wanted to start by touching upon uh, the biggest uh, and most important phenomenon, I think, in the global energy uh, industry, which is the North American, and particularly uh, the United States, shale oil and gas boom over recent years. Uh, and, there, and, you know, the, the geopolitical commentators see this as a kind of zero-sum game, and it's, it's, uh, it's the Middle East versus the North American production and so on. I, I tell you, from a private sector perspective, I think it's a huge positive for our industry. Um, you know, no one's talking about peak oil anymore. <laughs> no one's talking about, you know, the age of oil and gas being uh, uh, over. And I think looking at some key lessons, the first one, uh, perhaps the most important one, which I don't think gets enough play uh, worldwide, is that uh, you can't be green unless it's green. <laughs> you, can't, you can't achieve the environmental uh, targets without economic sustainability. 
Uh, what happened in this country was almost despite, uh, rather than because of government policy, as at least stated uh, government uh, policy of the administration. And it was the private sector. But it led to the uh, power mix, the energy mix, going from 20% natural gas to about a third. Uh, and the fastest drop, or the biggest drop in carbon emissions uh, in this country. I mean, we're down to 1990 levels of, of uh, you know, phenomenal achievement. You can back into Kyoto now, maybe, and, and take the credit for, <laughs> for it. Uh, and where you, whereas you see Europe, many countries like Germany, uh, setting a target of zero fossil fuels by the end of the decade or, or whatever it was and a mad dash for renewables and then of course dropping nuclear for, for domestic political reasons as well, which really I think uh, caused a lot of harm to the German economy, uh, in a way stifled the recovery, put a huge energy cost on German households and, and, and German industry and the Mittelstand. And, uh, just as the U.S. saw a return of heavy industry and huge job creation in energy intensive sectors as well as the oil and gas sector itself uh, and a big boost to the recovery, we saw the opposite uh, in Europe. And the irony being that Germany has rising emissions now and is importing lignite coal from the United States to burn for power. So through government policy, they've kind of excluded the natural gas from the equation gone for very expensive renewables, and now they're, they're importing coal. Uh, so that's a key lesson. And I'm not in any way implying renewables is not an important part of the mix. But there does need to be long-term strategic uh, energy policy planning that takes into account economic realities as well as uh, achieving their environmental goals. And you can have both. I mean, the, the, the politics seems to imply that the two are, are at odds. Uh, and I don't believe that's the case. I think it, it'll only work when the two are actually married. Um, the second key lesson is never underestimate the power of the U.S. private sector when properly unleashed in any sector, but certainly in the energy sector. Uh, and the level of innovation uh, has just defied all expectations. Um, and then later on, we'll look at the Middle East, and I would say never underestimate the ability of the Middle East public sector to, to get it wrong. Uh, whether that's uh, politics or often policy, uh, and we'll touch upon some of that. And then a third, never underestimate, uh, slightly unrelated, never underestimate the ability of the Chinese public sector to get something done, not where innovation is concerned, but where manpower is concerned. Uh, I remember uh, when I was at Shell, they, announced, they launched the uh, East-West Pipeline, the Chinese uh, massive pipeline. And, Everybody thought it was a crazy project that would take years, and it was like a new Great Wall of China. And they just put like a million and a half people on it, you know, this city and this city. Go build a pipeline. And they got it done. Uh, incredible, and, uh, and probably the only country in the world that can, uh, that can uh, do that when it comes to human resources. Um, I don't think you can, you can uh, replicate the US, unique U.S. ecosystem elsewhere in the region uh, in terms of the infrastructure, the capital markets, the traded uh, uh, energy hubs, the huge number of small companies, and the mineral rights belonging to the owner of the land. I mean, that's a unique uh, setup. But you can uh, learn from uh, the experience here in terms of uh, more access to finance, more role for the private sector, more competition, more transparency. Uh, and on that note, the event here on the 30th um, with Senators uh, Murkowski and, and Warner uh, on the, the task force for exactly how to do that, I think is very timely. Um, I th I th it's, of course, a myth. And I think that's, that's recognized now, this, this energy independence. Uh, nobody's energy independent. You know, un unless you're, uh, you know, living in a hut and burning wood from trees you cut down yourself, it's a myth. Uh, but energy self-sufficiency in terms of the supply-demand balance is a realistic scenario now for the United States. Um, and has led to at least a sense among politicians that we're less dependent on the Middle East or other parts uh, uh, of the world, although price-wise, I think that's a myth. But it's... Regardless of the realities, that perception has been an important impact on, on the geopolitical uh, uh, 
you know, context. Um, as I said, I think it's very good for the Middle East, uh, but I think the key, uh, th there's too much focus on, in my view, in the media and common commentariat on, on oil, and, oil and gas on the supply side. And a lot of that is because of the hangover of OPEC in the 70s, and it was all about supply and supply cuts. For me, demand is much more important driver of what's going to happen to price, and in particular, China. What's really going on there? You know, 7% growth, the new normal. Is it even 7% or is it more like 4 or 5? You know, the, nobody knows really with the numbers. Um, and even if it continues the growth, it's certainly less energy intensive than it was two decades ago. And that's going to have a big impact because all the demand for, for energy now is non OECD, uh, in particular China and India and, and the major developing countries of the world. So in my view, a lot more attention needs to be given to uh, what's really going on there and, and, uh, and the demand side than debate over you know, market share and, and who's going to produce another million barrels, uh, which you know, is, is not a major uh, impact when you look at potential demand growth year to year, as well as decline in existing production. Uh, too often, the media portrays current production levels as static and, and flat, and of course maintaining them is, is not easy, and there's a massive decline rate from some of the oil fields. Turning to the Middle East, overall, the messages were punching way below our weight as a region. Uh, the region has half the world's oil and gas uh, resources, proven oil and gas resources, roughly speaking. Uh, it accounts for less than a, a third of, of oil exports and less than a sixth of gas exports. So there's, you know, uh, still a lot of room there. And in recent years, it's been having declining market share. Um, a lot of that caused by conflict. Uh, countries like, uh, you know, of course, Iran with, with the sanctions, uh, Yemen, Libya, uh, you know, Sudan, other countries in the region. Uh, because of domestic uh, issues, and we can't ignore, of course, conflict and, and, uh, and, and the geopolitical instability. Uh, but I think a lot of it is also about policy. Uh, and um, there are some major areas of, of, of policy that need tackling in our region uh, and are starting to be tackled. Uh, one is subsidies. It's an area that the IMF is focused on a lot. Uh, in 2013, uh, the, the most recent figures I've seen, uh, $225 billion of value was just destroyed on energy subsidies in, uh, in the Middle East region. Half the world's uh, energy subsidies total. Uh, that's a huge loss of value. Most of it, as we know with, with these uh, subsidies, uh, ends up subsidizing the wealthy, the high consumers of energy in, in a personal uh, you know, uh, standpoint, and from the industry, you know, wealthy uh, industrialists, and doesn't actually help the poor people it's supposed to be targeting. So reform of subsidies is a key thing, and actually just this morning the United Arab Emirates uh, announced as the first Gulf state it's going to free up its um, gasoline pricing and uh, other petroleum products. Uh, so that's a big step. So uh, the fact that oil prices are lower now gives an opportunity to reform subsidies because the gap between the subsidized price and the market price is obviously less. Egypt, another very important country in the region, uh, you know, President Sisi, I think his third day on the job, went on TV and said, you know, we have to do this, it's going to be painful. Uh, and no one had really spoken to the Egyptian people like that before. Uh, the, the pattern in the region was to let the government announce it, the Minister of Energy, see the reaction if there's a demonstration and it's not looking good, cancel it and take the credit and then postpone the problem. So for him to do that, and, and he said, look, this is going to hurt, we're going to tighten our belts, I'm taking a salary cut of 50% myself. And actually the, the response was pretty good uh, on the Egyptian street. Um, and they recognize that this is a, this is a new reality uh, that they have to take on board because it's unsustainable. And it diverts money from important in areas of investment that are going to create jobs. I mean, looking at a country like Egypt, most of the government spend, you know, it's roughly a third debt service, a third salaries, and a third subsidies. So what's left for investment in infrastructure, uh, creating uh, jobs, tackling youth unemployment, all these other uh, important areas. So tackling subsidies is a big part of it. Efficiency, 
again, you're not going to achieve higher efficiency uh, when you have subsidies. It's, it's almost impossible, so it's interrelated. And there have been significant investments in renewables now. Uh, in particular, the cost of, of solar uh, has really come down. And uh, Dubai uh, signed some new deals on solar that really shocked the market, how low they managed to get that through a competitive international tender uh, process. And Saudi and others and North Africa have been looking, uh, looking at that. Um, Failure to reform on the subsidies and having very low domestic pricing means that we're consuming far too much of our own production. Uh, we have some of the most energy intensive countries in the world, uh, in the Gulf states in particular. Saudi now is maybe producing over 10 million barrels, uh, but it's consuming three. So actually it's, it's uh, you know, exports uh, has been reducing in a sense. Uh, so, and this is an issue uh, across the region, people talk about China and India, but actually the Middle East is up there among the fastest growing markets for energy because uh, we're getting high on our own supply. And that, that again ties into the subsidy issue and, and, and the efficiency. Um, the region has been dominated by national oil companies, as you know, uh, since the 70s. There is a big history to that. There is a history of, you know, Western imperialism and, and uh, uh, the, the countries not getting their fair uh, share and being dominated, and, and that, that's rooted in history. I mean, when my grandfather was the minister uh, in Iraq responsible for the oil sector and negotiating against, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the foreign oil, oil companies, the, the Anglo-Iraqi, they were paying a royalty of four shillings a ton. And the government had no say in anything. And they managed to negotiate a 50-50 deal, as Iran and other countries in the region did. Uh, and that was seen as a huge achievement, sharing 50-50 with, with the private company. Of course, today, with modern investment contracts, the government's getting well over 90% usually uh, for these big discovered fields uh, of the rent. And that's how it should be. But we still have the model of the national oil company to somehow protect the national interest. But this has led to large, um, in some cases politicized, uh, state monopolies. And monopolies are always uh, you know, a negative uh, at the end of the day. So how to, some countries have, have had an approach like in Abu Dhabi of partnering with, uh, on an operating level with private investment. Other countries like Kuwait, uh, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, have been basically closed to private investment, sometimes constitutionally uh, a ban. Uh, and we can look outside the region, Mexico. I mean, what happened in the last couple of years in Mexico, changing the constitution to allow private investment was a huge thing. I mean, their last bid rounds didn't work out so well because Pemex is still a state monopoly and resisting, you know, true opening up to the private sector. But I think it'll come, and it has to come, because they can see that in the Gulf of Mexico, 99.9% .9 of the wells are drilled on the American side. Uh, it's what's happened north of them in North America that has forced that change. Uh, and I think that kind of change needs to happen in the Middle East. We're not talking about privatization, what happened in Russia in the 90s. We're not talking about selling off of state assets. Uh, we're talking about a bigger role for the private sector uh, in developing those assets and the government uh, having more of a role of revenue maximization and regulation. You know, part of the problem is with these national oil companies when the minister is also the chairman of the board, uh, that means there's no split between the regulator and the regulated. Uh, and one entity is responsible for policy uh, and for performance. Uh, and there's no competition. Uh, and there's no transparency. So that leads to, uh, you know, in many ways, stagnant uh, development and everyone is talking about Iran and sanctions. The Iran story is not really just about sanctions. I mean, the Iranian production was six million barrels a day in 1979, and fell to you know half of that. And and it's you know sanctions played a role in maybe a million barrels being off the market in recent years. But the big decline was because of a national state monopoly and a constitution that prohibited private investment. Uh, so even though they have the highest gas reserves in the world now, according to the BP statistical review, they're a net importer of gas. Uh, and you know, looking next door at Qatar, what was what's been achieved from the same field, 
uh, in a very short space of time shows you it's often about the policy uh, and, and the investment incentives uh, and not just the sort of international uh, politics. Uh, I think um, the issue of uh, which um, Fred mentioned of youth unemployment uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, and the young people are the true natural resource in our region. And some of the work that the Atlantic Council is doing, in particular the Albright-Hadley Middle East uh, strategy and task force on these issues is very, very important. The oil and gas sector uh, employs, is less, uh, you know, um, employs fewer people today than it did obviously uh, two or three decades ago because it's far more uh, technologically uh, driven. You can manage a field remotely now or with a small handful uh, of people. So as it's, as it's becoming uh, you know, ever more important, it's not going to solve the key challenges, economic challenges. So economic diversification and proper use of the funds uh, is, is going to be very important. If we look at the countries in the region now, uh, I, th I see three uh, buckets uh, economically, and the IMF actually uses this classification now. Uh, we have the oil exporters with savings, basically the Gulf states, uh, who can weather these storms fairly well, and they have hundreds of billions in sovereign wealth funds, maybe four trillion dollars uh, in total. We have the oil exporters without savings, uh, which are, you know, Iraq and Libya and uh, Yemen and and, uh, and and these are actually, I think that it's 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 not um, a coincidence that these are some of the failing states in the region today. Uh, if we look at the big failing states in the region today of you know Iraq and Syria and and, uh, uh, and Yemen and Sudan and Libya, they are all have in common you know a military strong man for decades. Uh, oil resources and a failure to uh, to build a national identity uh, in a multi-ethnic or multi-sectarian uh, society, uh, and they're actually suffering more now. Uh, the oil exporting states with, uh, that are developing countries, in a sense, without savings, than the oil importers. The oil importers with the new price drop are actually doing okay. Countries like Egypt and Jordan and Lebanon are seeing reasonable economic growth, uh, not enough uh, growth. To, to keep up with population uh, growth uh, and, and economic needs, but certainly they're in a better position than some of the oil exporters. I mean, Iraq, we can get into in some more detail, uh, but they're really struggling now budget-wise with half the oil price and a war on ISIS, so maybe twice the requirements with half the revenues. Uh, so Iraq, uh, which is now talking to the IMF and the World Bank and, and, uh, and other countries about financial support, something that was unthinkable uh, even a couple of years ago. Um, how does this, uh, I'll sort of draw my comments uh, to a close uh, so we can get into the discussion, but what does this mean for US policy implications? I think the, um, uh, you know, the world and the Middle East is amazed or, you know, shocked by what has been achieved in the energy sector here. The fact that the U.S., uh, which had been seen as a declining energy power, is now going to be the number one producer uh, uh, again, uh, still with big, you know, import needs, but, but uh, that was un unthinkable. What are the lessons to be learned? Uh, and what can the Middle East uh, learn from that? Uh, because I think that um, the Middle East achieving more of its energy potential is very much within U.S. national interests as well. Uh, and I think there are the learnings that, that need to be sort of gathered and, and uh, uh, you know, exported in a sense uh, to the Middle East and other parts of the world. And I think the focus needs to be on the governance, uh, not just political governance, but the good economic uh, uh, governments, and governance, the right policies and the right revenue management uh, strategies, uh, transparency, pluralism, uh, and building solid and sustainable institutions to achieve that. And in particular, this idea of a clear split between the regulator uh, and the regulated uh, in these uh, economies on the energy side. I'll stop there and uh, leave the rest for our discussion. Thank you.
Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Majid, for your tour d'horizon, I guess, as they would say. Uh, and uh, I think we can begin maybe digging deeper uh, into uh, a few more issues. Let me first just also welcome everybody here. And I also want to thank you for your mentioning our Middle Eastern strategy initiative that Frank Ricciardoni is leading with Madeleine Albright and Steve Hadley and our task force report that will be coming out next week, which uh, I hope you all will be, uh, will be, inter will be interested in. Uh, you're talking about 15 years ago brought back some uh, brought back some memories for me. Uh, you may or may not remember, I was very much involved with the Baku-Tbilisi-Jehan pipeline uh, at that time. And uh, uh, the companies who were operating in the Caspian were complaining about pricing and so forth. And I remember going to see BP at that time. And they were, they've been the operator of the big oil field uh, off of Azerbaijan. And they gave, us this, gave this presentation saying, no matter what, over the next five to 10 years, the price of oil will not exceed $18 a barrel. That, that's what they considered at that time, 15 or 16 years ago, actually 17 years ago, the, ab the absolute max. And I think, it, as you said, I think it was around eight or $9 at that point. Uh, let me dig a little bit more into some of the issues uh, that are involving uh, the Middle East, also what you know, what you think our policies ought to be. Uh, you mentioned Iran uh, briefly, and of course, uh, we'll see how our, you know, the P5 plus one agreement. We'll see how that works out, uh, and also Saudi Arabia. Uh, how maybe you could talk a little bit about how you see things uh, developing. Uh, in Saudi Arabia with the changes in leadership, what you see uh, as the ramifications uh, in, uh, in the Gulf and in Saudi uh, relating to this agreement, assuming that it's, full, you know, that it's uh, implemented, and the relationship between the Gulf countries and Saudi with the Iranians as uh, this unfolds. And you know, we think about it often, I do, certainly from a geopolitical standpoint. You're looking at it also f very much from a private sector standpoint. How do you see things developing? So um, first of all, on Iran, I mean, the, and the potential return of Iran to oil and gas markets. So the um, current minister of petroleum, Bijan Zangani, was the minister in the 90s who achieved 4 million barrels a day of production and has stated it's his objective to get there again. Uh, and in the 90s, they used these buyback contracts, these sort of service uh, contracts. Because again, a little bit like Mexico, the Constitution was written after throwing out the United States, and it, it binded them and restricted private investment. So they tried to find a, a contractual mechanism that would have a private sector role. But it was fairly limited, short-term contracts. There wasn't upside or profit sharing. And oil and gas companies are not service companies, uh, and they're not banks. Uh, th they are geared up to take an oil price risk uh, and get an appropriate reward. And it's not about having a bigger share or a better return. It's about alignment of interest between the investor and the, the host government. So they're now talking about a new type of contractual arrangement uh, that will have longer term, better, uh, you know, uh, better for the investor and better alignment. But they're not going to change the Constitution. I think they've made that clear. They're not going to go the Mexican uh, route. Uh, and so it remains to be seen really how much uh, wiggle room they have within that constitutional, uh, you know. Can they add a million barrels a day? Yes, I think it'll take them some time. Uh, and it's not really very much when you consider what the US right. has been adding <laughs> over the last few years, uh, you know, another six million barrels from North America. Uh, so plus, Back in the 90s, you know, oil was lower, and there weren't as many options for oil and gas companies. Uh, whereas now you've got not just North America, but Africa and, and uh, you know, Latin America, other basins uh, of interest, and a higher oil price. So you really have to attract uh, the investors. Um, so I don't think it's going to suddenly have a big impact after the Arab Spring and all the turmoil they were put on, uh, on the back burner. 
And uh, the recent changes we've seen, Aramco essentially taken away from the oil ministry. So that split between the regulator and, and or the policymaker uh, and the company uh, might end up being a good thing uh, in Saudi. And in terms of the relations, it varies. I mean, Oman's relation with Iran essentially brokered uh, these negotiations with the United States, very different from Saudi's uh, sense of the geopolitical rivalry. Uh, whereas the UAE, I think, has always been a big trading partner of Iran, but there's a wariness uh, there. We saw it in an op-ed in the FT last week by the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, but more of an acceptance that, you know, uh, good relations uh, with the neighbors, which is what the uh, government in Iran has now declared is their next intention, uh, could be a good thing uh, if, it, if it comes to pass. You know, you mentioned that, uh, that uh, Iran adding a million barrels isn't, you know, maybe isn't that big a deal given the present state of, present state of markets. Yeah, obviously, the issue of lifting our oil export ban has been a major issue here uh, and will continue to be, I think, for some period of time. And we deal with that, by the way, in our report that we're issuing next week. But do you think that, at least in the short term, that our oil exports would be much ado about nothing, given the present state of markets? Or how big a deal do you think it is, ultimately? I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on, uh, on the U.S. Um, sort of export uh, debate, but it seems to me it's, it's, it would be a good thing uh, to lift the, uh, <coughs> the ban and it, because it's leading to some, uh, you know, strange dynamics, in, in particular the gap between international oil prices and domestic oil prices, which is growing again in the last week. Uh, and part of the issue is a lot of U.S. refineries are, are geared up for heavy oil and there's a sudden huge glut of light condensates because of the shale mm -hmm. gas uh, revolution. Uh, and it takes a while to, to, to change that infrastructure uh, paradigm. So I think uh, opening up and liberalizing the markets and, and, uh, would be a good thing. Um, I just want to go, I didn't really touch upon uh, Iraq and I just wanted to highlight because I think that uh, Iraq is a critical player. I mean, the IEA forecasts that 40% of world uh, growth in exports in oil are going to come just from Iraq, or should come just from Iraq, uh, between now and, and, and 2040, which is huge. Uh, and despite the conditions in the country there, the failure to pass the oil legislation now for eight years, uh, the uh, war, of course, against uh, ISIL, uh, the lack of uh, energy, uh, energy policy consensus internally. Despite all that, production is at an all-time high and it's become the number two producer in OPEC. Uh, and uh, so uh, exports, you know, production is about four million barrels a day, exports around three million barrels a day. So that's with all of that mess going on. If it actually got its act together, then achieving six or eight or even 10 or 12 million barrels a day is quite feasible. Uh, certainly has the resources below the ground. Uh, I have little doubt that it's, it's, it's true uh, oil reserves are higher than those of Saudi Arabia. I mean, it, the country is so underexplored. It's got a couple of thousand wells drilled ever, and most of that, you know, from my grandfather's time, compared to like 10 times as many in, in Saudi Arabia, and a million and a half just in the state of Texas. <laughs> so, you know, it just shows you the the potential in, uh, in Iraq, there are at least 300 undrilled structures in the western desert, huge undeveloped discovered uh, fields uh, in, in, in both the south and further north in, uh, in the country. And it could be an extremely important player uh, going forward. But getting, getting the policy side right uh, and, of course, achieving uh, you know, security stability uh, is important, as is building the right infrastructure above the ground. The pipeline networks, the export facilities, dealing with issues of bureaucracy and corruption and, you know, the, the, the state management uh, side of things. Yeah, what you basically just in the last couple of sentence, sentences answered what my next question would have been, which is how do you sustain the kind of growth that would get to the targets that 
uh, you were talking about. And to be a little bit of the devil's advocate, at least in the short term, uh, I would be very concerned. I assume you are, too. The fact that companies in the South, companies in KRG, such as your own, are just not getting paid. Uh, and how long, you know, how long can the oil production be sustained at the kind of levels that we're talking about um, if, uh, you know, if in fact there isn't even the ability uh, to, pay, uh, to pay the companies and uh, given the situation with ISIL and so forth. Mm. So the net result is the companies aren't getting paid, but actually the causes are quite different. And, right. and we should just sort of compare and contrast. So in Iraq, you had the, uh, uh, the north of the country, the Kurdistan region, a new regional government uh, without the history and the bureaucracy and, and, and the baggage in that sense, going for a pro-investment, pro private sector-led approach uh, with a model contract that was made public with, with inviting in different companies. Uh, and passing legislation uh, unanimously in Parliament, but after some good debate. So it started very well, uh, and many companies come in, discoveries, a lot of discoveries, a lot of growth in production. Um, the challenge there has been uh, uh, at the moment. Um, and then they uh, took a gamble of trying to do independent exports with Turkey, which didn't pay off. And in the meantime, they ended up losing the, the relation with Baghdad. And although the political relation with Baghdad has been uh, restored, Baghdad itself now has a shortage of funds, right. uh, uh, as I mentioned. So uh, the KRG is really getting squeezed. Uh, and there's a financial crisis. They haven't been paying salaries, uh, including to the Peshmerga, uh, for over a year now. Uh, so, in a way, they did the hard part right, the policy part we were talking about, but the implementation has, has had some, uh, some major issues. Uh, and the south of Iraq has been the opposite. They went for, uh, despite a constitution uh, written with U.S. help, as we know, that calls for maximum investment using latest market methods when it comes to the oil and gas sector. Very different from the old Mexican one or the Kuwaiti one or the, or the Iranian one. Uh, the implementation has been more of the old mindset. Let's go back to a national oil company. Let's have a service uh, contracts with the investors. Now, what they did achieve was the idea that you do need private companies. And that's no small achievement, because they used to celebrate the nationalization of the oil sector, and it was seen as very much linked to the national sovereignty. And they had transparent bidding rounds to assign the fields. Uh, so that was very positive. Uh, and they are one of few countries in the region to monthly publish the exports and the government revenues from oil. And they've signed up to the Extractive uh, Industries Transparency Index, which is ironic because they rank among the most corrupt countries in the world in the Transparency International. So the, the aspiration is there for the transparency uh, uh, and so on. But the contracts they signed were these service-type contracts where there's very limited service fee, like a dollar or two few dollars a barrel for the company. But the company gets refunded its expenses uh, up front, regardless of any growth in production or, or so on, um, which, uh, in my view, does not align the investor with the host government. Is bad both for the companies and for Iraq. Uh, it's not going to get it to six or eight or 10 million barrels a day. And now with the oil price collapse, they can't afford to refund those expenses. So it, we're, having, we're reading strange headlines this year of Iraq thanking its companies, like BP and others, for agreeing to reduce their investment. Uh, you know, and that's when you know an oil policy has gone wrong, <laughs> when the government is discouraging investment uh, because they can't afford to refund uh, that investment. So they, they do realize now, uh, and, and, and with this government, that as a bit more of a consensus government in Baghdad. Of course, their immediate crisis is, is the security one. But there is a recognition they need to get the oil law passed uh, and the oil revenue sharing law, which is a different law. The two are often confused. I mean, the, the oil law is how to grow the pie. The revenue sharing law is how to divide the pie. In my view, you actually need that second one first, because then everybody wants to grow the pie together once they've agreed how it's going to be uh, uh, split. So you need the legislation, and I think you need a new model contract. Uh, 
a more investment type contract where the government's not having to fork out money before it sees any production growth, where the company gets remunerated as a percentage uh, of, of the profits, uh, that, you know, a small percentage of the profits that the government is getting. Great. Well, thank you. I, I've asked enough questions. Let's open it up to people from the floor. Uh, we have microphones. Uh, I would uh, ask when you ask a question to stand up and to identify yourself. Uh, so I see three right in the front row. We'll go from left to right uh, for the three hands that I've seen, and uh, starting with the gentleman on my left. Uh, hi, yes, uh, my name is Mohsen Khan. I'm at the Atlantic Council, and a friend of Maji's as well. Maji, one of the puzzles that um, I have, which you touched upon also, and every commentator does, which is um, the collapse of oil prices last year. Um, and everyone goes back to fracking and, and shale oil as the principal cause of this happening. And what puzzles me is, of course, we knew many, many years ago that fracking was going to bring oil onto the market. I mean, the investments had been going on for years. So why did it take so long for the price actually to move uh, several years before it uh, moved? And secondly, today, futures markets are still saying $75 uh, for one year out, over and uh, 75 to $85 five years out. So uh, there is a disconnect here. And uh, I was wondering whether you might want to address that. Sure. I'm not going to forecast oil prices. Uh, <laughs> if I knew how to do that, I wouldn't be here. I'd be out there making some good money on it. Uh, and I'd charge you for the advice, too. Uh, but I think what happened last year was, 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 a, was more than just the shale oil, because that had been a gradual and had been seen for, for some time. It was a confluence of, of factors. And I think a big, a big part of it was the, which doesn't get, uh, in my view, again, highlighted enough was the sudden reassessment of where Chinese uh, long-term growth rates are going to be from now on. Uh, and, you know, 7% uh, being the new normal, but nobody really believed in the 7%. Is it 4 or 5? I mean, uh, who really knows? I think what happened at that OPEC meeting, um, uh, you know, m my understanding, I mean, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that this was geopolitical and Saudi trying to, you know, with U.S. encouragement, trying to crowd out Iran and Russia. And, and, and maybe that was a, that was a useful uh, secondary benefit uh, to some in Saudi, but really it was economic. They have uh, bad memories of the 80s when they chased the uh, oil price and uh, it went from, you know, went down to 2 million barrels <laughs> production <laughs> in Yamani's time. The oil price collapsed anyway. <laughs> and their rationale was, uh, we're the low cost pr producer. Why should we be the first to cut? Uh, and let's really see how resilient is the US shale uh, industry and renewables. And you, know, and you say collapse. I don't actually use the word collapse, because even in my you know, uh, time, uh, and I've only seen a couple of uh, of cycles, 60, 70 is not a collapse by, you know, 15 years ago we were in single digits. <laughs> um, uh, so I think the, the rationale was let's, let's test. Uh, and I think there was, by the way, a willingness to cut, but it was not to cut alone. Uh, you know, Venezuela and Iran and others were going and saying, please cut, please cut. And the Saudis said, fine, if we, we'll all cut 10%. But Iran said, no, we can't. Venezuela said, no, we can't. And Russia said, no, we won't. Uh, and they've never really cut since the end of the Soviet Union. They've never cut. Uh, so Saudi refused. Uh, and you know, let's shake it out. Let's see where this uh, goes. I think from the US uh, perspective, it still remains to be seen what that uh, price elasticity of supply really is and how resilient the shale, uh, you know, it's not a static industry. Uh, it's extremely fragmented and diversified. It's an extremely dynamic sector. And there, it's not like a government just, you know, responding with a fixed cost of production. We've seen phenomenal innovation. We've seen phenomenal uh, fall in, in, in costs uh, domestically. 
definitely some jobs lost, some investment uh, down, uh, rig count changing, and production uh, reduction. Uh, and we'll see more of that going forward. Uh, but it hasn't been a collapse of the, the shale industry here by any means. Uh, and I'm not sure one was really uh, expected either. I think you were next, Julia. Yes, thank you. Julia Nane, Energy Ventures, LLC. I had a question about Iran potentially becoming a regional pipeline gas supplier. And maybe you have a view on uh, whether political and commercial pricing disagreements, Iran to Iraq, Iran to Oman, Iran to Saudi Arabia even, how would that work out in the future? Sure. So Iran has you know, massive gas resources, as we mentioned, and actually apart from uh, a big chunk of the North Field or Qatar North Field or South Pars, as it's called in Iran, there's a lot of other multi-trillion cubic feet fields across uh, in the Gulf uh, and elsewhere. Uh, but Iran also has a massive domestic market, it's 90 million people, very cold winters, mountainous country, and in a way it's fragmented. So they have a shortage of gas in the north and they're importing gas from Turkmenistan, uh, whereas they have a huge abundance in the south. Uh, it's a big country. Uh, so uh, th part of the challenge for them is their markets, really, pipeline markets, are mainly to the north. Although the Gulf states, uh, the GCC, are all short of gas, with the exception of Qatar. Uh, we signed the first uh, natural gas contract with NIOC back in 2001 they were to deliver gas to the UAE. They were supposed to start in 2005. It did not uh, start a mix of domestic politics, internal disputes over price expectations, and technical issues. They had leaks in the pipeline. They were delayed on implementing the project. We had to take them to arbitration, which we've won. And now uh, it, that is already in the damages phase, although the contract hasn't been terminated. Uh, and there have been settlement discussions, which is a matter of uh, public record. The problem in Iran is, is uh, when many of these countries also, is decision making. Uh, in, in especially on the issue of price. I mean, oil is easy because you can open the newspaper and see the global price and nobody gets blamed for selling at that price. Natural gas, you know, uh, there's been a lot of uh, commentary on the ir Iranian love of negotiation, uh, as we've seen in recent months. Uh, the problem is they negotiate internally against themselves all the time. So deciding to sell uh, natural gas to another country at a certain price is very problematic. No one wants to take the decision for it. No one wants to take the, the responsibility uh, for it. So they end up uh, you know, signing, in my view, unrealistic uh, contracts, like $11 per MMBTU to Iraq. Why does Iraq need, need that? They're flaring a, a BCF and a half a day of their own gas in the south, or a similar price for Pakistan. Uh, which is really unaffordable uh, for Pakistan. They can't even afford to build a pipeline at the moment, let alone pay that as a natural gas price. So actually, we don't, you know, there are two, only two uh, sort of uh, contracts that were signed, and they were signed, you know, you know back in late 90s, early uh, 2000s, which are with Turkey and with us. And both ended up in arbitration for either non-performance or, or substandard performance on the Iranian side. And pricing issues have, have been a big uh, challenge. So even with sanctions lifted and even with the massive resources that, that are there, the issue of the big domestic market with a subsidized uh, domestic gas price, uh, there were some ta attempts to tackle that, but it needs to go further. And the issue of decision making on, on price contracts. Uh, is, I think, going to hold them back and still be a challenge for Iran. Yeah, you know, they, just following up on what uh, Julia was asking, it, it really does raise some very interesting questions because there's, there, there are assumptions, uh, maybe, you know, ill-thought-out assumptions, that, well, Iran will, if, assuming, you know, everything is implemented, that Iran will end up being a major supplier to Europe and helping European energy security. And there's a real question whether that would be the case. Yeah, there is the pipeline that they have that goes to Turkey, which ships about six or seven BCM into Turkey, which is an old, decrepit pipeline that needs a lot of work. 
I guess there is a possibility, theoretically, that Turkmen gas, instead of crossing the Caspian, could transit through Iran into Turkey uh, and into Europe. But it seems to me, following up on what you were saying, it, it may be a lot easier, given the domestic needs and given the demand within the Gulf and in Asia, that ultimately, as they do develop their markets, that, that might be, those might be easier routes for them. Uh, the, we had a question on this. Yes, right there. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. My name is Sahan. I'm a student. Uh, I'm, I'm a student here for, here for the summer in D.C. My question is regarding with the you know with the with the Iran deal and the opening up of Iran en energy markets. Could it could Iran uh, be a possible challenger for Russia uh, towards Russia when it comes to the Central Energy uh, cent Central Asia when it comes to energy and will, uh, how would how would the Iran deal and the current energy situation further affect the Russian economy? Do you mean on the natural gas side or, or uh, as an oil producer? Or? Um, natu natural gas and both. So, I mean, uh, having a private pers sector perspective, as I said, I don't see a zero-sum game. I, I think more energy production and more diversification from more countries to more markets is in everybody's interest, and particularly in the United States' interest. Um, so what's been holding back uh, Iran, uh, apart from the sanctions, is actually some of these institutional issues that really need to be reformed. And there has been some uh, public declaration that, they, as I said, they want to improve the contracts, bring in more investors, and increase their, their uh, production. But it's not easy to tackle some of those things. As far as Russia, I mean, I, I'm sometimes, uh, you know, um, uh, surprised how much, particularly in Europe, there, there's still this Cold War mindset, and you know, in the European Commission, there's you know posters of the Russian bear. And, you know, <coughs> I mean, at least in terms of, uh, I'm not talking about Crimea or East Ukraine or all the other you know uh, political issues, but as far as an energy supplier, they've been pretty reliable. Uh, you know, there was a few days interruption in 70 years. Uh, which was maybe a strategic mistake, but it was because the Ukraine wasn't paying their bills. It wasn't to harm the European economies or anything like that. Uh, certainly having diversity of supply uh, for Europe is a good thing. We're seeing LNG imports grow even in, in markets like the UK now, uh, and that's a good thing, as well as more pipeline uh, routes and more pipeline uh, suppliers. And everybody can, can benefit from that. I mean, we, we need to get to having more trunk lines and more uh, multi-user corridors so that we start to approach, even from a distance, the type of energy infrastructure that is already existing here in the mainland uh, United States. Fred, you wanted to? Yeah. And then we'll have time for three or four more questions. But Oh, okay, we need your mic. Get a mic, Fred. No. Sir, up here. Majid, I hate to be so prosaic, but I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about your company and also how you're, in, in this whole context of your painting, what do you see as the challenges at, as a business leader and for your company, and where do you see your opportunities? And just give people a little bit of a feeling where you're operating, where you see opportunities, and where you see challenges. I think what's particularly interesting is also you're operating in many places where you're dealing with state actors, and how, how, how do you navigate that? Thank you. So as a company, we're now 45 years uh, operating, headquartered in Sharjah in the UAE, but with offices in, uh, in the UK and uh, elsewhere in the Middle East as well. Um, our, at one point, we, we had operations worldwide, and including in uh, then Yugoslavia and Argentina and Canada and Montenegro. And, but we, we're now really very much focusing uh, on the Middle East region as a group. The main uh, you know, production areas of focus being the UAE and Egypt and Iraq uh, and business development in other uh, countries uh, in the region. And it's always with state actors, as you say. Um, so Crescent Petroleum is the oil and gas upstream company privately owned. We have our affiliate, uh, which is Dana Gas, which is a listed company and listed in the Abu Dhabi stock market with bonds listed in, in the UK. Uh, and um, the Crescent Group, which is uh, the wider group, uh, of which I'm vice chairman, family business group, and it's really in the infrastructure space. 
Uh, so there's a power contracting, uh, there's a, a port management terminal, uh, you know, and logistics with the biggest private uh, container terminal operator. We've actually just made a, an investment in Florida now in, in, in the U.S. as well. So it's very much in the infrastructure space, uh, uh, energy, logistics, uh, power. Uh, and in terms of key challenges in the region, uh, we're very committed to the region. Uh, you know, it's our home. We, 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 you know, of course there are risks, but there are huge opportunities. I'm actually quite bullish and optimistic on the region going forward, uh, despite all the challenges. Uh, I think the key is to get the policy right. The key is to have sustainable private sector driven economic growth, inclusive growth. Uh, job creating growth, particularly for the uh, for the young uh, generation, there are a lot of smart uh, people uh, with a globalized perspective uh, in the region, uh, and there's hope in the new generation. There are also risks. I mean, this youth bulge that we have, we need to create 100 million jobs in, in the next couple of decades, uh, is a huge opportunity. And countries like Turkey have shown, you, you know, uh, you put them into meaningful employment. You don't need to worry about growth. It'll happen, and, and uh, you know it'll create huge wealth. Uh, but if they are not empowered and, and properly, uh, you know, uh, employed, uh, it's a it's the biggest geopolitical risk for the region, and I think for uh, for the world. Uh, and I think you cannot um, delink it from some of the. I mean, clearly there's there's a poisonous ideology that needs to be tackled, but it feeds upon the lack of economic opportunity. What I'm going to do is we'll take three or four questions in succession, and then we only have a few minutes left, and then you can respond to those questions sure. together as you, as you see fit. Uh, the, okay, too many hands. Okay, we'll go the first here, then there, uh, in the back, and then one over here, and I think we're going to have to stop at that. My name is Sanjin Choi, Langham Partner. Thank you so much for Lucy and succinct remark. You mentioned you walked the Sherry... Um, company, so would you able to share your views, what lessons learned from Sir Mark Moody Stewart? And you also mentioned Dana Guest, one of your advisory board members, Lord Simon of Highbury, who was former chairman of BP. Would you able to learn, share what lessons learned from two uh, leading CEOs of UK companies? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question. Hi, I'm Dave Buffalo from Buffalo Global Development. Uh, thank you so much for your insight. And what I was wondering, you mentioned in volatile countries, what you need is security, governance, economic development, jobs creation. Um, do you see the need for a new model where the corporate sector, the private sector, can work more in hand in hand with the international community and the host nation in, in, in some of these governments and people in, in developing strategies where everybody benefits? Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. And then there was a question from the back. Yeah. Hello, I'm Francis Wilson with the Middle East Institute. And Mike, I was really interested by the, your statements about, um, I guess, state-owned enterprises in the Middle East. And I was, it made me think of um, the airline, the aviation companies in the Gulf, which are extremely successful. An example would be um, uh, Emirates Airlines, where the chairman is also a member of the ruling family. And he's also the main regulator of the aviation industry. So I guess my question would be, when it comes to state-owned enterprises in the Middle East, um, is it really about more private sector investment, or is it about streamlining the state-owned enterprise system? Because we've seen that you can have tremendous success in that yeah. regard. That's a really good question. Uh, and there was right over here. Yeah. My name is Ari Silman. I'm with Securing America's Future Energy. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, the possibility of continued economic diversification in the GCC in a low oil environment, because much of the steps that these states have taken over the past few years has come at a time of very high oil prices. So I was wondering about the feasibility of continued economic diversification in a low oil price environment. Good. All very good questions. Excellent questions. So I'll, how long have I got? A couple of minutes? Uh, each well, we've less? got, I'd say, five minutes. In total. <laughs> okay. Unless you only want 30 seconds. Yes, no, three bags full. <laughs> so on the first question, I mean, I, I loved my time in Shell. Uh, Sir Mark was the uh, boss at the time. He was a wonderful person, both with senior management and with junior people uh, like myself. Uh, he's done some fantastic things with the UN Global Compact and uh, uh, 
uh, and, and other initiatives since then. Uh, and David Simon is, has been a, you know, an inspirational uh, advisor also for our company. I think that uh, I had a great experience and I learned a lot from these you know, super majors. And, uh, uh, but they have their limitations. Uh, I think that you know they, they become like governments. They're big and bureaucratic. And at the time in Shell, you know, we were in a low oil price world, and these super majors were created uh, to try and uh, survive in a low oil price world and make money in the downstream and so save costs and so on. In a hundred dollar world, it's you know it's dinosaurs trying to dance a little bit. And uh, the innovation has been a real challenge. And they completely missed the shale revolution. In fact, they lobbied the Carter administration uh, to ban the use of natural gas for new power uh, and industry back in the 70s, which is the main reason we have you know, <laughs> carbon emissions problem, because the rest of the world followed suit. Uh, and they completely missed, you know, and they came late to the game with the shale, oil, and gas, and, and tried to acquire and made some mistakes. Uh, in that way, it's a bit like the pharma industry. You've got the big pharma companies, and then you've got the smaller biotechs. And, you know, and the innovation comes from the smaller companies, but then the muscle uh, can come from the big companies. And we have that dynamic in the oil and gas uh, sector. I think the majors are wrestling with uh, what this means to them. You know, do they split? Do they keep returning money to shareholders? They've spent a couple of trillion dollars to basically stay in the same place over the last decade. There hasn't been the production growth or the reserves growth or, or, or the value growth. Uh, so they're very cash flow positive, but they have a real challenge over the business model. Um, the new model, uh, private uh, public partnerships in various sectors, particularly where big capital investments are required, is very much the trend and the name of the game in the Middle East. We need the right supportive legislation. Some com countries like Jordan have done it very well. Uh, others have to catch up. Um, uh, on the state-owned uh, enterprises, uh, absolutely, but uh, you know, Etihad and Emirates are the exception. If you look at Saudi or Kuwait Airways or others, it's not quite, you know, and, and I think in the UAE, because of the federal system, we have internal competition or co-opetition, as we call it in business school. And we, we, we've had a very private sector approach, Singapore-like, even in the public sector. Uh, and that's been extremely uh, successful. So a combination of reform of the state-owned enterprises as well as giving more room for the private sector. And uh, the private sector has been very successful in the aviation space, particularly the low-cost airlines uh, like Al Arabiya and Al Jazeera and so on. Uh, airways. Uh, so you need the combination uh, to have uh, healthy sectors. In terms of the economic diversification uh, in the Gulf, actually uh, it's usually more efforts when oil prices are lower. Uh, because uh, when oil prices are high, you know, you've got plenty of revenue, you don't need to worry too much. Uh, so usually you see more of a push at the reform when oil prices are, uh, are lower. And, we saw it with the energy subsidies in, in the UAE, for example. Uh, it's a big, big challenge. And the problem really in the Gulf is the distorted dynamics of the labor markets uh, for the nationals because they keep uh, raising salaries in the public sector. Uh, so you know, usually private sector salaries are higher. In the Gulf, for nationals, it's not the case. You get paid more for working shorter hours in the public sector. So how are you going to encourage uh, those young men and women to work in the private sector? Uh, w while you publicly ask the private sector to step up and do more and take on more young people uh, in employment, how are they supposed to do that uh, you know, it, when, when you're distorting the market? And what happened post-Arab Spring, uh, just when many good consultants, McKinsey and, and others, were working on uh, you know, economic diversification strategies, suddenly concern over instability, they just doubled salaries in the public sector uh, in many countries, trebled them in the military. Uh, so how, you know, which, which made it much more difficult. It was short-term uh, you know, stability, which is actually causing longer-term uh, distortions and bigger economic challenges. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Majid. You know, it's wonderful. Uh, when we have people 
like you coming in and from the private sector, it's refreshing uh, to get sort of the common sense, pragmatic, practical approach uh, that you have. Uh, I think this was a terrific session. Very good questions. Thank you to the audience. Uh, I hope that we will see you at, uh, I know I've seen some of you before, but we'll see you at many more Energy Center events, including next week, the launch of our task force on June 30th. And uh, so thank you very much. We have to get you off to an interview right away. Uh, and, uh, but again, thanks to everybody.